Right, well, across this lecture, we're going to look at how we can define the fitness of our athletes through one number. And fitness there in inverted commas because fitness means different things to, to different people. But in understanding this composite score, this one score that captures it all, which is referred to as the total score of athleticism, we will also gain a greater appreciation of other key st statistical terms such as the standardised scores and normal distributions, which are really important moving forward. So what can you look forward to me talking about across this presentation? Well, of course, the normal distribution and in understanding this, that really important part of statistics, the mean and the standard deviation and alongside that Z scores and T scores. We'll also look at some of the Excel functions that help us calculate these key metrics. And on the right, you can see that there's a paper that we've put together that will also elaborate on this. And there's a YouTube link that also talks us through the calculation of this TSA. Now, where did this concept or approach come from? Well, imagine sitting in a room with all the coaches, some of the stakeholders, maybe you've got the funding bodies, say UK Sport, looking to invest in the athletes to support their training further. And you're saying, well, they, they jumped this high, they ran this fast, and they can lift this much. I mean, that doesn't really mean anything to them. It means something to us as S and C coaches, but but to them it it, it it doesn't land on anything. All they want to know is are they fit or not? And they have their own idea of what fit means. So we need to find a way to encapsulate fitness, which may include some aerobic fitness, some strength, some power. We need some way of saying, yes, they are fit, they're this fit or they're 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 lacking. You know, we would also say, well, you know, this is how fit they are, or this is how high they jumped. And, and again, they don't know what a good jump is. They don't know that uh, a 30 centimeter jump is, is not a very good. And actually, until you get around 45, 50 higher, that now they're excellent jumps, you know, to, to, to be crew. They would know, for example, um, and just to, to prove a point here, how fast you should run 10 meters in or 20, uh, 20 meters in. So we need some comparison. And also, in terms of selection, if we make that comparison based on their own teammates, then, then that's a really good way of showing whether someone is fitter, again, in inverted commas, than, than their teammates and might help with selection and, and funding. And also, are they getting any better? So if we use that, that measure of fitness to rank them within the squad, as their rank changes within that squad, we get an idea of whether they are indeed improving and acting on that feedback and showing some um, key improvements around the metrics that we've identified as important. So the question is, can we create a composite sc score and still compare athletes with each other across individual tests? That's the ultimate a goal and this is this is tricky because we're trying to compare apples and oranges on one hand we've collected data on the bench press in kilograms we've measured sprint speed in seconds we've got jump height in centimeters and body composition as a percentage for example how do we add all of these individual scores together so can it be done well absolutely it can be done and the key to it being done is by transforming all of these scores into what's called a standardized score. So we're going to get into that in the next few slides. And the one that we're going to be looking at in particular is called a Z score. So just before we start to tackle what standardized scores are, we have to understand the normal distribution. So if I said to you, now, uh, that I went out onto the street and at random I, I tested 10,000 people, all right? So it's a, it was a busy period uh, and they formed the range of scores below. So from zero centimeters, so someone, there was someone I measured who couldn't even jump, but there was someone I measured across the 10,000 people that could jump 50 centimeters. Maybe there was, there was a few. Where would the greatest frequency of scores be within that range that I would have tested? I hope you're all shouting at the screen saying in the middle and absolutely you'd expect me to test more people that can jump in the middle of my of my range. So 
where will the the least amount of scores or uh, be recorded or the least frequency of people jumping and again hopefully you would have identified that there would be fewer people at the edges or the extremes of the recorded ranges so only a handful that could barely leave the ground and likewise those that could jump the dizzy heights of 50 centimeters and then of course we start to work our way up and then up again and then up and so you kind of get this distribution which is mainly around the the middle and less people around the edges or as you work your way out to the edges and what that forms then is this normal distribution and that's why we have this bell-shaped curve or it's often referred to as a bell-shaped curve and actually so many things in life conform to a normal distribution so let's look here we've got the average height our, our, our average height relates to a, a normal distribution we have blood pressure relates to a normal distribution Again, you can see frequency over on the left hand side these are frequency distributions these normal distributions we've got pizza delivery times they all follow a normal distribution there'll be so many things iq just about everything if you test enough people it will conform to a, a normal distribution and certainly one of my favorites is the weight that we select when we are doing some strength training So what we have with this normal distribution is we have the mean right down the middle, okay? Then what we can use is a standard deviation. I like the standard deviation, think of that as on average how far our scores away from the average. But when we look at the standard deviation, so we can say that within one standard deviation, so plus or minus one standard deviation, we encapsulate 68% of all the scores. So 34% on one side and 34% will, will, will score on the other. Then if we go out two standard deviations, you can see we capture 95% of, of the scores uh, from our, our frequency distribution. And then finally, three standard deviations takes us to 99%. And you can go five, six. You never actually end up getting to uh, the end point. So let's consider our testing and when we test enough players we'll get a normal distribution for change of direction speed for example so the majority of people will score around the the average and there'll be some a few that are incredibly fast and also a few that are incredibly slow obviously relative to the population that, that we test we'll likely to get one if we test counter movement jump height for example so most people will score in and around the middle there's going to be some awesome jumpers and some that that aren't very good jumpers at all again relative to our distribution and again if we did the squat and this is always assuming we test enough people then most of them are in the middle some are going to be super strong and some of them are going to be relatively weak and then we can get the same for height now, what we can do, if we want to compare all of these, that they're all in, in different units, they all have a different place there, is we could all, uh, we could make the, the mean of all of these tests so that we can compare them zero. So if we make the mean zero, and then just report how far in standard deviation units, again, each athlete falls from the mean. So you, then, you would then have a positive score indicates above the mean and a negative score indicates below the mean, which remember for, for change of direction speed would, would be a good thing. You'd want to fall below the mean because it's, it's time uh, unlike the others. So we'd have our normal distribution. We would then give it, uh, if, if you scored, uh, the average, you'd get a score of zero. That means you're bang on average relative to your teammates. Then we could put, well, if you, we then see how far you fell from the mean. If you got a score of one, that means you are one standard deviation from the mean. Obviously, if you got a score of two now, that means you're two standard deviations from the mean. 
three, three standard deviations from the mean. And, and of course, if it's negative, then you fell that far from the mean, but on, on the opposite side. So now these are all standardized scores. All scores are relative to the mean and how far you fell from the mean expressed as these standard deviation units. And we can calculate this standardized score, this Z score, by getting an athlete's raw score. We, sub we subtract that from the mean and then we divide by the standard deviation. So let's look at the, the, the calculation of that in Excel. So, so if we look here, first of all, we've got our some counter movement jumps here. I'm just assuming that we got more than 30 people. So this is just for brevity. We'd have to calculate the average as, as demonstrated there. We also need the standard deviation. And then for the calculation of Z score, remember it's their raw score minus the mean. And we're going to put brackets around that so that the equation does that bit first. Then it divides by the standard deviation. We press enter. So that's the Z score. So that athlete is 0 0.9 standard uh, deviations below the mean because it's a negative score. Now look what happens when we drag it down. And that's because we drag the whole formula down, which means the mean and standard deviation keep moving a cell down. So what we want to do is fix the position of the mean and the standard deviation, as in we want to fix the cell number that it's in. So we do that through the dollar sign. So when we stick those dollar signs in, the only thing that gets fixed is the mean and standard deviation, but the raw score would, would change in line with the cell that we were in, which is exactly what we want to do. Let's consider now then how we might report that Z score. So just to make the maths easy here, let's just assume that the athlete scored bang on one. So one standard deviation from the mean of zero. So that would mean that that person scored better than, well, there's 2% on the far left of this curve. There's another 13.5%, a 34 and another 34. So this person scored better than over 80% of his or her colleagues or scored in the top 20%. That depends how you want to spin that feedback. We could then look at this athlete score across multiple different tests. And if we make the mean again, or we know that the mean is zero, so, the, so zero means average. That means you've scored average relative to your teammates. If you score above average, you scored better than your than your colleagues. If you scored below average, you scored worse than your colleagues. And as we'll look at maybe shortly is that actually with speed and agility, where it's time and where you want to be below average, just to make the reading of this graph a bit easier, if we multiply that Z score by minus one, it flips it just so that we can say we want everyone to be above that average line to score above average. So at a quick glance, you can see that, that this athlete here needs to improve their counter movement jump and squat jump scores because they score below average relative to their teammates. And of course, the height of the bar relates to a particular standard deviation that will tell you exactly how much uh, better or worse they are than their colleagues. So here's a table that describes what each Z score relates to as a, as a percentage. And we can calculate that percentage in Excel, which we'll look at in just a moment. And we, we saw on that previous slide how that percentage would look as we go across. So in Excel, what would we, what would we have to do? Well, we're working here with a Z score of 1.8. So let's put that formula in from the previous slide. So it's the norm S dist formula in Excel. So from a, a a normal standard normal distribution then it asks for the z score which was 1.8 and there we put true and here you get your z score uh, which corresponds when converted to print uh, percentage to 96 percent of course we can then just change that z score and you can see that negative 0.9 equates to 18 percent 
and so on. So of course, we will define fitness by a series of tests and those tests are deemed important to that particular sport. So the tests will likely change from sport to sport and will even change from, from club to club within the same sport because they either have a different playing philosophy or they just regard some tests as more important than others. So here you can see what counts with jump, RSI, pro agility, 30 meters, uh, 30 meters sprint. And for whatever reason, the coaches have decided that these tests define the fitness as required to compete at this sport or within this position of this sport. Now, the first thing you'll note is that here we could be comparing two athletes uh, with each other. So we're comparing athlete A and athlete B. Maybe this can help in the, in the selection uh, process. So you, who, who do we think is better, athlete A or athlete B? Hopefully you can see just by looking at histogram that athlete B scores better. And if you look on the far right, you've got that TSA score. So when you get all the Z scores, and you take an average, you'll get a TSA that, that, that provides that composite score of all of those tests combined. So that so athlete B has a better TSA score, a better average Z score. And also what you can see illustrated is, look, we're gonna test uh, numerous physical qualities. So there's likely to be through an injury or whatever reason, maybe there's an athlete that's not going to be able to take part in a particular test. And that would just be represented by a missing, a missing bar. How you then choose to report that and present that back to the coaching staff. Look, there was nothing wrong with the, the previous slide, but of course we like to uh, make things look a little bit easier on the eye and, and absolutely why not? So here you could have the raw scores, which might mean something to you. Uh, you, could, you then have the Z scores, which help provide an understanding of what they're, they are strong at, what they're weak at relative to their teammates. And equally, you've got a ranking system. So you could then rank where their Z score falls relative to their teammates. And that's that traffic light system um, on the bottom, represented by the green, the orange, and the red dots. And then finally, you can either have a TSA score or where they rank given their TSA score. Now, so far we've been looking at the Z score, which works on this normal distribution. And to get a normal distribution, you typically need 30 or more uh, athletes to take part. As that squad size gets less, and gets further and further away from that magic number of 30, then you're less and less likely to get a normal distribution. I mean, in sport, you could argue you could still get a normal distribution off of, say, 16 people, maybe less, because they're from a really select population. So if you go and test a really good football team or rugby team, you're not likely to get real extreme scores. So they're more centered around their mean. If you went out onto the street, however, and you randomly tested 12 people, I mean, the, the, the range of scores you would get would be so crazy. There might not be any clustering around, uh, around the mean. or So you're, from that point of view, you've got no chance of getting a normal distribution. Anyway, let's just work on this principle of working now with less than 30 people and you, and you fear that this normal distribution has been compromised and so too, therefore, is your ability to use a Z-score. So in this, instance, in this instance, then, we would use T-scores because now we're working with what's called a T-distribution. T-distribution looks just like the normal distribution, except, as you can see, those tails are a lot bigger. There's a lot more numbers or a greater frequency of scores are held in those tails relative to the normal distribution. So you're gonna get slightly different scores if you're working with a T distribution than you are uh, with uh, a normal distribution using Z scores. But you'll see that actually the scores start to converge and they become pretty much so similar, uh, pretty much so the same as you hit uh, that sort of number in and around 30, maybe a bit before. So how do we calculate the T score? Instead, well, it's now just the raw score minus the mean. That was the same for the Z score divided by the standard deviation. That was the same. But here now we then divide it by um, square root of the sample size. So how do we uh, do that? So in Excel, so we need to know our sample size. So 
obviously I can just count up there. It's clearly uh, 12, but I'll just pointlessly show that you can do that through this count function. Well, not pointlessly, just goes to show what else Excel can do. It can, can do so many different formulas that we should be taking advantage of. So look, right, first let's just change that Z score to a T score. So look, it's, it's identical except for the fact now that we're gonna add in the standard error part, which involves us also dividing by the square root, so SQRT, and now we put in brackets our sample size. And of course, we want to lock that in place as we pull, as we pull it down. I mean, I could have just as easily not even bothered having a reference point for 12 and just written the number 12 in that actually might have been a little bit easier in this instance. But again, just showing what Excel can do and some of the other functions that we need to, to incorporate. Okay, in terms of calculating the percentage off the back of that T-score, well, it's now gonna be uh, calculated uh, by knowing the number of players, like we said before, but also the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is always your number of players minus one. And in other videos, I'll talk about the degrees of freedom. So, to calculate the percentage, we're going to use the t.dist function. Again, we're going to use our t-score. We're going to use our degrees of freedom. We've got true, and we can convert that to a percentage. And as you then start to change that t-score, you'll know you'll get these different percentages that aren't miles away from what the z-score would be, given that the, the degrees of freedom or the numbers of players we're working with is 18. And then if we was doing that across a whole squad, you know, rather than doing each one individually, so we've got our their counter move jump score there, they've got their T score next next to it. I know which we could just have dragged down, but we can do the T dist and, and drag that down now as well. So and this would be the same obviously if you was doing a Z score or a normal distribution. You can see in that example, I just wrote in the degrees of freedom as 11 as opposed to having some reference cell for it. And I know it looked like I had 200% there, but that's only because those standardized scores were, were so high. But when you open it up to an extra decimal place, you can see that those uh, ranks change accordingly as you would expect. Okay, well, that coupled with the YouTube link should really help understand some of these key statistical terms. Again, the normal distribution should have a good grasp of that, as well as what standardized scores are and how they can be used uh, across different tests.